Despite the Peace of Nicaeus in 421, diplomatic hostilities between Athens and Sparta continued. In 420, the polis of Elis, which controlled the Panhellenic sanctuary at Olympia, banned the Spartans from the Olympic Games, and a Spartan aristocrat who raced his chariot using a Boeotian ringer was publicly flogged. The incident foreshadowed the rise of an anti-Spartan coalition on the Peloponnese, including Argos, Elis, and Matinea, an effort coordinated and backed by Athens. The Spartans responded by raising a large army, although the Spartan king Aegis initially hesitated to engage. Finally, in 418, the Spartans engaged an army of Argives, Elians, and Matineans, supported by an Athenian battalion. In this hoplite battle, Thucydides described the tendency of hoplites to drift to the right as each man sought to nestle into the protection of his neighbor's shield, so that both sides ended up inadvertently outflanking their opponent's receding left flank. However, the Spartiate contingent had the discipline to halt its pursuit and wheel about to roll up the opposing line, resulting in a smashing Spartan victory. As a result of the battle, Argos withdrew from its alliance with Athens, and an aristocratic coup replaced the democracy in Argos with a pro-Spartan oligarchy. In 416 BC, the Athenians demanded that the neutral island of Milos join the Delian League. In terms of dialect, the Melians were Dorians, speaking the same dialect as the Spartans. It was during this period that sub-ethnic categories of Dorians and Ionians, based on modest linguistic variation and modest cultural quirks, gelled around the geopolitical poles of Sparta and Athens. When Milos refused Athenian demands, the Athenians dispatched ships and hoplites to conquer the island. Thucydides imagines a debate between the Melians protesting Athenian aggression and the Athenian commanders. When the Melians put forward moral arguments about justice and equity, the Athenians famously make an argument based on raw power. The strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. This quote remains the centerpiece of realist theories of international relations. The Athenians reduced Milos through starvation, and then massacred the men and enslaved the women and children. The mercy the Athenians had given to Mytilene seven years before was a distant memory. 500 Athenian clerics settled on the island emptied by genocide. In 415, the Athenians undertook their most aggressive military action to date, an invasion of Sicily. The invasion was ostensibly to aid the polis of Segesta, an Athenian ally. But boosters proclaimed the overarching goal of asserting hegemony over the entire island, which would involve overthrowing Syracuse, the most powerful polis on the island, a colony of Corinth. This was not the first Athenian expedition to Sicily. In 427, an armada of 60 ships had intervened in Sicilian affairs, although the expedition had returned largely considered a failure. This new expedition was therefore controversial. Its leading booster was Alcibiades, an up-and-coming politician and intellectual adherent of Socrates. One voice of caution was the general Nicias, who argued before the assembly that the expedition would require at least 5,000 hoplites and 100 ships. Nicias may have hoped that such a commitment would dissuade the assembly, but instead the demos voted the resources and voted Nicias to join as one of the commanders. As the expedition sailed, a massive act of vandalism shook Athens. Culprits in the night mutilated a number of the herms that marked <clears throat> the boundaries of, uh, in Athens, including in the front of many private homes. 
It is quite likely that the mutilation was orchestrated by opponents of the expedition, but suspicion ultimately fell on Alcibiades. Alcibiades sailed with the expedition, the charges still unresolved, but his powerful political enemies eventually indicted him in absentia for not only mutilating the Herms, but also for profaning the illusion mysteries during an aristocratic drinking party. Alcibiades defected before he could be brought back to Athens for his trial, eventually making his way to Sparta. In Sicily, the expedition was quickly disappointed to find that Italian and Sicilian allies were now reluctant to join the Athenians. The Segestans were suspected of having lied about their resources when they petitioned aid. The Athenians nonetheless surprised the Syracusans by landing outside the city, and an inconclusive hoplite battle was fought in 415. Here, the Athenians inflicted heavy casualties upon the Syracusans, but were unable to press their advantage because of their lack of cavalry, a critical and chronic weakness of the expedition. The Athenians hunkered down to besiege Syracuse, trying to encircle the city with a massive wall. The Syracusans, meanwhile, raced to build counter walls to intercept the growing Athenian circuit. The first two counter walls failed, and the city was close to surrender. However, the arrival of a small Spartan expeditionary force, commanded by the Spartan aristocrat Gylippus, changed everything. Under Gylippus's energetic leadership, the Syracusans and their Spartan allies assaulted the incomplete Athenian siege works in the north and successfully intercepted them with a third counter wall. There was now no hope that the Athenians could circumvallate the city. In the summer of 414, Athenian reinforcements arrived, commanded by the Demosthenes, who had previously led the force at Pylos. If the reinforcements were insufficient to the task, even if the total force now stood at roughly 10,000 men. The generals waited in the false hope that the, the Syracusans might surrender, and also out of fear that if they returned to Athens in failure, they might be tried and executed by the Deimos for incompetence. The wait proved fatal. The Syracusan fleet hemmed the Athenian fleet inside the great harbor of Syracuse and inflicted a serious defeat, allowing the Syracusan navy to blockade the Athenians in the great harbor. The generals considered putting the entire expedition on the surviving ships to force a breakout, but the men refused, considering this option to be too risky. Desperate, the Athenians decided to retreat by land, marching south. But out of supplies and pursued by Syracuse and cavalry, they ultimately capitulated. Nicias and Demosthenes were executed by the Syracusans, despite the protests of the Spartans. The Athenian prisoners were taken to a quarry where many died of hunger, thirst, and exposure. Those that were able to sing the plays of Euripides, who was popular in Syracuse, were spared. Even before the final Athenian defeat in Sicily, the Spartans voted to restart the war with the Athenians, confident not only because of Athenian overreach, but also in hopes of material support from the mighty Achaemenid Empire. And so next time, we will look at the last phase of the Peloponnesian War, the so-called Decalaean War from 413 to 404 BC. We'll talk soon.